Greetings, citizens, and welcome to Political Viewpoint. I'm your host, Eric, and today we're going to be covering the neo-neo debate. So neorealism and neoliberalism, both schools of thought, both approaches to policy making. Why is it such a big political battleground, and what does it affect? All of these things are going to be quickly answered here for you today because we've gone through the hard part, which was teaching both approaches to policy making, both theories and uh, both of the approach and how they make policies. And now we can just compare and contrast, explain the debate, and explain why it is so significant because of how it affects each and every one of us on a daily basis in some shape or form. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. So just to get us a little refresher and a base in terms of where this neo-neo debate comes from. So the neo-neo debate is between the neo-realists and the neoliberals, hence the neo-neo, right? And this has been the most dominant debate in political science, in particular the international relations arena for the last 20 years, right? Because you remember that the neo-realist school of thought founded by Kenneth Waltz, 1977, and the neoliberalist uh, school of thought comes right after that uh, period of time in the 1980s and onward. So it's more than just theories, right? This is conceptual frameworks. So what that means is actually how you make policies, how you draft them, and then it goes down the chain from there. So it's more than just the actual political theories that govern uh, these approaches, okay? Because it governs and forms uh, people's views of the world. What are the research priorities for political uh, analysts and researchers in the field of political science, but also in the government institutions? And this influences policy debates in the political arena. So in your local uh, courts, in your local, um, uh, trying to think of the word in English right now, in your local councils, your uh, community councils, and at the larger level, in the Senate. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. In the Senate. And yes, I described in the, in the liberal and neoliberal uh, video um, the, how uh, this approach to policy making can affect people's views of the world is because these are based in how we perceive humans and human nature and the role of individuals in a state and, and the role of the state towards individuals and they are at odds with each other so this is why this is influencing um, these three things here. Okay, so moving on, we know that both neorealism and neoliberalism are status quo oriented, okay? And they're problem solving theories. So uh, neoliberalism, definitely a lot stronger and more focused at trying to solve collective goods problems. And the status quo for them is whatever the moral and universal uh, kind of values that are they're trying to push in the and that is absolutely determined by what the status quo is in a given uh, country in a given community you can take it from there and the realists of course very status quo oriented um, because all of their uh, political endeavors or about the status quo of the balance of power in the international community, what's going on internationally, and then what's going on in your own state um, in terms of uh, what are the pragmatic decisions that need to be taken under right now. Again, remember separating morality out of the question, out of the equation. Um, so it's very much based in the here, in the now um, for decision making. Both of them are just slightly different approaches to it. That's why there's the debate, okay? And as I explained in the neoliberalist uh, uh, vi previous video, um, the neoliberalists and the neorealists do share a lot of uh, assumptions and some core values when we're talking about um, uh, 
specific actors, whether it be individuals or states. Um, like I said already, values and kind of power arrangements. Um, now, what do I mean by the power arrangements? That is the three pillars uh, that govern state behavior. Both schools of thought agree that there's dominance hierarchy, there's reciprocity, and there's identity. Those are the three, um, and having to address those is fundamental for, for both of them and how they make policies. So those things they share, and that's why we presented that on this channel first and foremost, because understanding that, you can then understand all the other schools of thought and how they make policies and why policies are being made because they're trying to address those three pillars in one way, shape, form of, or the other. Um, now the big difference, or this is a key component of the debate between the neorealists and the uh, neoliberalists, is that they study two different worlds for the most part, okay? Neorealists are concerning themselves with um, what is considered in political science high politics, um, kind of big, uh, important state-centric issues such as security, power, survival, right? The neoliberals uh, are more focused on what is traditionally considered low politics. Again, this is kind of something, as I mentioned in uh, the liberal uh, list vi video, perhaps terms that should not be necessarily used because it, you know, indicates uh, certain things. Uh, but anyways, so low politics, you know, political economy, institutions, cooperation, human rights, um, things of that nature considered low politics. So let's get down into identifying and talking about the neo-neo debate itself, okay? So I already mentioned it. The neorealists and the neoliberal, uh, the neoliberalists are studying two different worlds. And that's a big problem and why debate is sparked in the first place. You're coming from two different angles. Okay, neorealists, like I said, they're dealing with the high politics, security, military. Neoliberalists, the institutionalists, right? The low politics, political economy, environmental issues, human rights. And then this split that I just explained in full depth, absolute versus relative gains. So keep this in mind, right? So neorealists, they're more cautious about cooperation, right? They're thinking, all right, is this in my best interest? Truly my best interest. And is this benefiting anybody else more than it's benefiting me? Because in which case, I don't want to be a part of this because then it's going to make him stronger relative to me. Again, remembering that that's a key important thing for neorealists is the relativity of power, right? In the, in the international system, according to Kenneth Waltz. And the, that's where the neorealist thought is coming from. So, neoliberals on the other side states can be persuaded not to cheat and to make these absolute gains because again emphasizing that there's not going to be any losers if we all come together and we solve this problem because solving this problem is going to make humanity as a whole that much greater and that in and of itself is a victory because everybody's going to take part and reap the rewards of this victory and it's not going to affect the balance of power. If anything, it's going to maintain a better balance of power. That's the argument there. Like I said, now hopefully I'm more adequately showing you guys the two sides to the fence. These are the two sides to the fence. There's, there's other angles that we will cover, functionalism and constructivism, but really this are the two main sides of the fence on these issues and the perspectives therein and the approaches and how policies are made um, from. Okay, now we can't talk about this debate without talking about globalization because that is the current state of our world and it challenges the idea of state power a lot. So for neo-realists, they argue vehemently that Although with the amount of economic and political globalization that's happening, you know, think about uh, even on Facebook, you can talk with your friends that are all the way in the Middle East if you're all the way in Latin America, things of this nature. Um, especially we're talking about economic globalization and, and global trade, things of that nature that support and are proponents of 
neoliberalism, because again, remember, neoliberalism cemented in uh, um, capitalism and free trade and uh, the democratic peace theory, things of that nature. However, again, going back on topic, neorealists, they argue that states are still principal actors because the new concern that has come from globalization are security issues. And again, this feeds into their loop of their, you know, quote unquote, high politics, right? Security issues, power, defense, um, security, survival, right? These are huge things that have come with the age of globalization. Think about the greatest challenge in our day and that wars have been waged on now um, is terrorism and the global, quote unquote, threat of terrorism, uh, drug trade, um, big global issues like this that have been being made global thanks to globalization. Um, furthermore, immigration, um, all of this stuff. This is where the neorealists strongly come back and say states are still principal actors because they're having to deal with these new threats that are uh, arising from this age of globalization. And currently there's a lot of evidence uh, for this argumentation and we can see it almost on a daily, um, especially in Europe currently, um, but also now uh, in uh, the Western Hemisphere in Canada and the United States. Now, the neoliberals, uh, in regards to globalization, um, they believe globalization, of course, to be a positive force because, again, they are grounded in their values of capitalism and, um, and the idea that, you know, uh, the democratic peace the uh, theory will work out if we can spread democracy as far as it possibly can and if everybody is a liberal democracy and everybody's engaging in uh, capitalism and, and free trade and unrestricted movement that we will all eventually be equal and that we will not we we'll all have the same values so we will not fight each other uh, we will not fight each other you know so the idea that all the states in the international community are going to benefit from economic growth economic growth for one country means that there's going to be more trade to go around in all the other countries and then that means that there's going to be more money that can be made um for investors or international corporations or the state itself um from that other state benefiting so this kind of idea that say if all of a sudden yesterday or tomorrow uh greece became an uh, a strong economic country that that's going to benefit um, you know, the international community and well, it's particularly uh, the European Union, for example. Uh, just a quick argument and uh, perspective I can bring up for you guys, an example. Um, some neoliberals believe that states uh, should promote institutions to manage the consequences of globalization and to create positive consequences. So what do we mean by this? That is exactly what we just talked about, some of the issues that neo-realists uh, are arguing that states are having to deal with. Issues of immigration, issues of terrorism, issues of uh, security. So for, neo for some neoliberals, they believe that they need to promote and empower institutions to handle this sort of, these sort of risks and, and um, consequences. We can already start seeing that in the private sectors um, when it comes to private security companies and uh, security companies that have gone international. Um, there's some companies uh, that I know uh, from my personal history very well, such as Paladin Security that is now, you know, is a Canadian company that has now gone um, international into the United States. Um, and it's now Pal American Security down there. Um, this is, you know, and they deal with a lot of the issues that police forces can't um, deal with and where extra resources are required. So you're starting to see a lot of these institutions and corporations popping up to solve issues that the state doesn't have enough resources to do itself. Um, and this is a pretty um, interesting and valid argument in a lot of cases uh, about, I mean, it's already happening that institutions are trying to solve uh, problems that the, uh, the state 
is struggling to, um, and they're kind of coming in as third party uh, actors, a lot of the times hired by the state or allowed by the state to operate uh, to help solve these issues. Um, so um, this is a strong belief and a strong debate that the neoliberals have is that by empowering and promoting these institutions, we can actually help solve these big uh, high politics items that are usually regarded to the field of neorealism. They can actually solve it through neoliberalism and how they do that is through institutions coming together, working with states and states working with them to solve these big collective issues so in terms of collective security, collective defense, and remember we covered those. So that's the neoliberal uh, argument to that. And another good example of this um, would be Europol, Interpol, you know, um, the police agencies of Europe and the police agencies of the international world coming together, sharing their resources to work on um, international uh, crime syndicates and criminals and bringing them to justice and, you know, bringing their resources together uh, to solve these issues. A good example of that. So carrying on the debate, the debate around, and this is more of a theoretical one, absolutely. However, again, policies are created from these ideas and these theories. Um, in particular, this would be in the sector of security and defense, okay? But there's a huge debate about the causes of war and peace for between the neorealists and the neoliberals. Uh, so for neorealists, you have to remember that aggression uh, is a result of states trying to balance each other, right? Mistrust and seeking relative gains. Remember the dominance hierarchy um, in the core beliefs that govern state behavior, right? That's the main pillar that they're always thinking about and addressing when it comes to their theories on, on war. And a lot of the intellectual precursor from um, Karl von Clausewitz and his On War uh, pe uh, piece of work definitely influenced this perspective and this, yeah, this perspective, okay? And that stability for neorealists, um, you know, in war and in peace, right? Stability is going to be happening through bipolarity, a strong hegemon, and bandwagoning, okay? So, uh, you know, that makes sense because neorealists, uh, thought, especially Kenneth, Kenneth Waltz, like I said, 1977, Cold War is still at its peak. It, um, and so that idea of having a bipolar system, two strong hegemons or two strong groups, uh, and with a lot of bandwagoning going on of the weaker states uh, buying into this uh, dom uh, respective dominance hierarchies, and then they're all trying to maintain the balance of power in between uh, that closed system. On the flip side, neoliberals treat aggression as a result of imperialism, a lack of cooperation, non-liberal societies in general, right, going with that uh, democratic peace theory, right, and the undemocratic nature of international politics currently. So for neoliberals, that's why aggression is taking place, is because there's still... Um, Countries that are non-democratic have tyrants um, and, you know, a result still coming out of the imperialist colonial eras. And again, uh, we identified that earlier in this presentation about a lack of mutual interest and thus cooperation on uh, key collective um, issues and, you know, the presence of non-liberal societies and the undemocratic nature that currently is existing in international politics. For neoliberals, how do they maintain peace? How do they have stability? Their argument is that th only through cooperation and strong liberal international institutions that have powers to mediate and enforce decisions can peace be maintained and achieved. Okay? So this is an interesting argument. Because you look at 
what is traditionally considered a neoliberal institution, the UN. They have powers to mediate and ha unhold discussions, without a doubt. The real argument comes with enforce, and the ability to enforce decisions. I'm saying this now not because, like I said, I'm trying to be neutral, but I want to present that other side of the argument for neo against neoliberalism on this one, because this is a, a part of their their theory and this is a part of their approach to policy making, and it's a it's a hole in it, you know. Enforced decisions currently, right now, there's not a strong um, international organization that has the ability to enforce decisions and that mediates. There are two international institutions, one that's good at one and one that's good at the other. So mediation, I would definitely say the UN, and enforcing decisions and enforcing coming in terms of you know military power and things of this nature, um, or even economic, we, wanna, we can list another one for economic, okay? Um, NATO is a huge one in terms of enforcing decisions when it comes to collective security for the countries that are partaking in it. And for economic, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank, either one of those. Huge um, ability to enforce economic decisions, sanctions, um, um, reparations, all the, that sort of thing, right? So for neoliberals, you know, but that's their argument, is that the only way that this cooper that, that we're going to get peace is through having cooperation and strong international institutions. So that's what, you know, they can be calling for that. And you know what, maybe one day um, that will happen. But currently right now, and this is one of the major uh, areas of debate is whether or not that currently exists or could possibly exist in the future. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why, and that's what the neoliberals themselves are saying too, is if neorealists are getting in the way and certain policymakers and policies are being made that prevent, uh, that are currently preventing uh, this from happening, having a strong international institution that can mediate and enforce decisions, then that's why uh, currently uh, peace is not so widespread and stability is hard to maintain. So kind of an interesting, it's an interesting argument, uh, nonetheless, and an interesting debate. So that, folks, is the neo-debate neo in the realm of political science um, and the two very different approaches to policy making and policies that get made in the international arena and the local one that affects all of us um, in one way, shape, or another, especially when uh, large international events take place. And this is where a lot of the debate occurs in your uh, national senates. Thanks for uh, tuning in today f to Political Viewpoint and checking out the Neo Neo debate. Um, this was kind of a big undertaking. I understand that um, it took a lot of time, a lot of uh, your guys' time to study up on both schools of thought and then come together uh, into this video to showcase kind of the, the big debate. And it is important and the significance should be able to be seen when you look at international events and things occurring um, at the local and international level in terms of policies and being able to identify it as either strictly um, neorealist or uh, neoliberal perspectives and approaches and then be able to kind of discern and analyze things for yourself in a new way that you perhaps could not before. Um, and like I said, for all the political scientists out there, this is nothing more than a very uh, quick juvenile um, uh, recounting of uh, the story you already know and have already learned 
and uh, hopefully still you just enjoyed the way that it was presented here again uh, we'd like any feedback comments um, uh, anything that you think we can streamline a little bit better or meant or you know fail to mention that might be more important um, other than this uh, uh, thanks for joining us on this series, and then we're going to be delving in quickly to functionalism and constructivism, which should be nice, quick videos, and then we're going straight into um, talking about things going on in the world concurrently, in the international realm, and as well with all the different geopolitical regions and things that are of the utmost importance that all of us uh, need to be aware of and need to talk about and a lot of uh, these perspectives and uh, are going to be showcased and now you'll be able to understand a lot of our presenters and be able to identify almost immediately where they're coming from and where maybe some of their biases lie um, because you'll know um, and be and you are now educated in the major two major schools of thought and approach to policy making that exist within the field so thus you'll be able to understand the experts within the field when they talk uh, about um, certain things that are occurring and certain policies that are being made or policies that they would like to see be made or introduced uh, to solve certain political issues that are occurring or that are uh, happening um, and that we're talking about on this channel so that's where all of this uh, comes into play is and why it is important. It's tough to try and cover, but it's important to cover because it gives you the tools, the contextual tools going in to these um, discussions and, and, and being able to identify these key factors immediately and, and with great poise and intelligence and being able to have an intellectual conversation um, with anybody else on political issues and kind of see perhaps where they're coming from. And even they themselves may not know that that's where this bias that they might have is coming from. And, you know, sometimes they might not know that they've been influenced by neorealist thought or neoliberal thought. Um, not, And it's completely different than ideologies in terms of conservatism um, or liberalism or you know and that's specific to every single uh, country right every country has its own political ideologies um, there's some you know big global ones communism capitalism uh, you know liberalism democracy uh, all these type of things right but regardless this should help you is the the end of the story on that note that i'd like to make other than that uh, be sure to check out our patreon page link as always in the description below uh, for all the newest updates and news on our articles and our videos as they're being produced and when they are released. Um, as always, feel free to reach out at us at our email at political.viewpoint at gmail.com if you have any interesting questions uh, that you'd like addressed in future episodes and uh, possible topics for consideration. And if you want any of your own work uh, featured here on the on. Uh, the channel and any of the uh, different mediums that we have, be it medium for written material, uh, the YouTube channel for anything uh, voice or video related. And um, yeah, so thank you guys very much for tuning in and we'll see you next time here on Political Viewpoint.